And we've gone through stuff, we've gone through pains, we've gone through trials. And the beauty of it all is that the consistency is Christ. Jesus is the answer for absolute everyone. And that's what I love most about Teen Challenge is that it's providing a good, safe, healthy environment for people to find the love of God that has always been there the whole time. But how many know that we run exactly from the thing we need the most? The thing that's going to save us, we run from the most. And sometimes it takes, we find it in our teens. Sometimes we find it when we're adults. But the consistency is Christ, and he's been there the whole time. So I, I am so thankful for the ministry of Teen Challenge. But I'm going to come, call you up, and then you're going to introduce and talk a little bit, but then we're going to get going. But let's give Teen Challenge a hand this morning. Now, I know you guys got up and sat back down, but could we just stand up one more time? And let's just praise God because he deserves it. Hey Amen. You can be seated. He deserves it. He's a faithful God. So a lot of you guys know the story about Teen Challenge. It started over 60 years ago by a pastor named David Wilkerson. He pastored a small church in Pennsylvania, and he was studying one night, and he decided to open up a Time magazine, and he read a story about, I think it was seven young boys who were on trial for murder. And he just felt led by the Spirit to go to Brooklyn where it happened and talk to these boys. And when he got there, he ran into a whole bunch of roadblocks, um, but God had a plan through it. He never ended up talking to those boys, but what he did do, he started Teen Challenge. And the first center was started in Brooklyn, and now they're almost in every state. They're in multiple countries. Um, and we have two facilities here in Wisconsin. Another one may be opening up in La Crosse, too, so praise God for that. If you guys want to pray. <clears throat> If you guys want to pray for that, pray for um, their center that's opening up. Um, I know they, like I said, Roblox. Man puts Roblox in front of God's plan, but God, he, he breaks down those walls. But my story started off in jail too, basically. You know, I struggled with drugs and alcohol all my adult life. Um, I started smoking marijuana, drinking at 14. It slowly escalated as I went through high school. Um, it progressively got worse. My senior year, I was doing painkillers. Uh, right after I graduated, I ended up getting a call from my mom or from my sister saying that my dad had committed suicide. And even though we weren't that close, um, he was still my dad. He was still there to discipline me. He was still somebody I feared, um, a righteous fear, a loving fear, um, because he was my dad. So after he left, my mom had to play the role of both the mom and the dad. And she couldn't really feel the shoes of my dad. She, she loved me too much to discipline me. And I think I was too manipulating to, for her to do that. You know, I would get in trouble. She would ground me, and then I'd do something. Or, you know, I'd, I was the youngest boy. So, she, you know, I think that has a special place in mom's heart. But, you know, right after I got the news, I started injecting heroin. And my life went down quick. Um, from 18 to 21, I overdosed every year, sometimes multiple times. I went to jail every year. That's what my life consisted of. It's not what I thought. It is what my life consisted of. Um, I was like the enemy. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God has given me that life and the life more abundantly. So as, as, I, went, as I went through my mistakes, I went to jail. I got out. I did good. I never had the Lord, though. I never knew the Lord. I knew him as the, sister, or the, the God that saved my sister through her addiction, but I thought I was always too young. I thought I still had living to do. I thought I still wanted that lifestyle until my mother's house ended up getting raided um, by the drug task force in Green Bay um, because I ended up committing some felonies. And after that, I sat in jail, and like the fourth night there, my cellmate introduced me to the gospel. He introduced me to... Um, actually, in Romans chapter 7, how Paul, he was such a theological person, but he struggled with the same thing we all struggle with. We all struggle with the sin that lives inside of us, but God sent his son to save us from that. He sent his son to redeem us, to set us free. You know, we're going to sing some songs about a chain-breaking God, and that's what he's done in my life. That's what he's done in all these ladies, the guy's life, in your life, maybe. Whether it's addiction, it could be anger, you know, I know a lot of people struggle with anger. I know a lot of people struggle with um, depression, anxiety. But guess what? His name is above all names. No matter what you're going through, it doesn't matter what you're going through. His name is above it. So just say Jesus. When you're in the storm, just say Jesus. 
You know, when Peter was walking on water, he's like, Lord, if that's you, call me. And Peter, he was like, come. And Peter started walking on the water, but the storm started to get big. He started focusing on something that wasn't Jesus, and he started to sink. But when he started to sink, it's not like, you know what Jesus said? You can look it up in Scripture. It said, and immediately Jesus stuck out his hand. So if you're going through a storm, God's not going to let you sink and sink and sink before he saves you. He's right there for us to take hold of him. So as we sing today, as we give praise to the Lord, stand up, praise God with us. You know, we serve an awesome God who is willing, who is able, and he loves us no matter what. So we're going to watch a seven-minute video, and then you guys are going to hear some songs, some testimonies, just about how great God is. Thank you. Good morning, church. My name is Cassie. I'm 22 years old. I actually live down the street from here, so I'm from Kenosha. Um, Growing up, I was born in Virginia, and then we moved here when I was about eight. Uh, Growing up, I really had a great foundation. Um, Both of my parents who are actually here, very firm Christian foundation. I grew up in the church. I, you know, every day I was pretty much in the church, especially in the summer. Um, So growing up on a rocky foundation was not what I was known to. Um, So me doing anything dumb shouldn't have really happened, but it did. Um, I also had this acceptance issue that was never really known to people. Um, I never thought of myself as worthy, as lovable, as pretty. Um, There were people that were way more of that than I was. Um, So growing up, uh, when I was younger, I was a little bit bigger as a kid, and um, I just got, got bullied, and that's where it started. Um, When we moved here, I met this girl who became my best friend right away. Um, She had cancer, but she loved me like no other friend had ever loved me. Um, She passed away in seventh grade, and from there, I just, everything was stripped away, you know. I was in a bigger middle school, had just transferred, and it just, I was, I hated life. I didn't want anything to do with God either, because how could such a great God take away such a precious child? Um, And so from there I started, I was, I felt terrible on the inside and I wanted to show that on the outside. So I started self-harming by eighth grade. Um, When I got into high school, um, I got in with a group that introduced me to uh, to marijuana. Um, I thought that they liked me, but we all had acceptance issues, so we couldn't accept ourselves, so we accepted each other. Um, And just bad company, good character, very badly corrupted. Um, From there, um, it was a really rocky high school. I eventually did graduate. Um, And then what became a once in a blue moon thing was like an every day, all day, all night. By the time I was 19, I was experimenting with psychedelics and different types of drugs because I wanted a fix that I didn't know how to get and everyone else was having a good time, so why shouldn't I? Um, So I started doing that on the weekends and that spiraled out of control too. Um, I started stealing from my parents. I started... um, taking their credit cards and charging them up and then not telling them and then saying, oh yeah, by the way, when my mom got the statement. Um, And then by the time I was 21, I met a guy, well, reconnected with a guy who I thought really liked me and who I thought really cared about me. Um, And he didn't want anything to do with me, really. He actually kicked me out on the streets of Milwaukee to um, sell myself to to meet the needs of our addiction, which was uh, crack cocaine. And it was terrible. Um, Luckily, it was only a three-month stint, but within those three months, I lost everything. I caught a felony charge. Um, I lost trust with my parents. I lost my brother's trust. Um, Just everything was downspiraled. I had no friends. I didn't care about anyone. And if I died the next day, I was so okay with that. My dad came and got me one time, and I ran again. So the next time, he said, I'm not helping you, which is probably the best thing he ever did because it finally got me to realize that um, I can't do this on my own. I contacted a church church friend, and she picked me up, and then I went to um, St. Luke's in Racine. Um, I stayed there for a couple of days, and then by the grace of God, three days later, I was walking into the doors of Teen Challenge January 10th of this year. Um, God has completely just restored my whole entire relationship. My faith with him has never been stronger. Um, My mom is my best friend. I look up to her so much. And I used to think she was strict, but she just loved me that much. And uh, 
God is just so great. Um, my relationship with my youngest brother is so restored. With my middle brother, we're just great. And God is just so excellent. And um, it's just divine interventions is what he does. And it's he meets you exactly where you are. And for me, it had to be rock bottom because I wasn't going anywhere else. Um, God grabbed me, pulled me out of that water, kind of like what Brandon was saying earlier, when my faith will slip in and put me on a firm foundation. And I know that I'm a child of God. I know that I'm a daughter of a king. I know that I have a purpose. Um, I'll be grad. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be graduating this December. And from there, I'm going to do a re-entry program down in North Carolina because that's where my heart's really calling me to go. And it, that's only possible by the grace of God. I couldn't tell you a year ago that this was what I was going to be doing, preaching to people and being excited about the Lord. But, man, I'm on fire. So thank you. Good morning, church. My name's Brian, and God bless this church. You guys are really great. I really feel like you're all my brothers and sisters. Amen. Uh, like I said, my name's Brian. I'm from Chicago. I'm 53 years old, and... Uh, after high school, I started, um, I was 19, I started my career at UPS, um, and I had a family, and I stayed away from all the hard drugs, I didn't do anything like that, but my addiction was alcohol, like I said. Um, so as I went through my career at UPS, I would come home and I would drink, and I thought I had everything under control. Um, I would, you know, just drink after work. I was basically a functioning alcoholic. Um, I would, I continued going to work. I completed 25 years at UPS, and I was 46 when I retired. Um, and when I retired, I thought, you know, I could just kick back and, you know, collect my retirement checks. And even though I was just drinking alcohol, I thought that was okay. So as time went by, I started drinking more and more, and uh, I was pretty much got to the point where my family left me because of my drinking. I was drinking from the time I woke up to the time I went to bed, and that went on for about three years. And a year ago, this November, right, a year ago from right now, I noticed that my legs and my feet were starting to get numb. But I didn't care about going to doctors. I didn't believe in doctors. I was afraid to go to doctors. So I ignored it, thinking it would go away like every other headache or anything. You know, I didn't think it was any big deal. Um, in December, I started losing balance, and I started falling when I would walk. Um, so I got a little more concerned, but still I didn't go to the doctor. Um, this went on until January, and then in January, on January 2nd, when I woke up from, uh, when I got up in the morning, I, I stood up from the bed and I collapsed on the floor. Um, I couldn't walk, I tried to stand up, and each time I tried to stand using the bed to brace me, I would fall down. Um, so, not wanting to go to the doctor, I crawled downstairs, down the stairs to the refrigerator, and I grabbed myself a beer, and uh, went down to the other lower level room where I watched TV, and. I had a couple beers, you know, I kept going back and forth crawling because I still didn't want to go to the doctor. Um, so this went on until about two o'clock in the afternoon. And each time I tried to stand, I couldn't stand, I kept falling. So I got wise and I called an ambulance. The ambulance came and um, took me to the hospital and on the way to the hospital, my blood pressure was 244 over 137. I was close to a stroke, and um, they called into the hospital, and as we pulled into the hospital, the doctors were all waiting there. Um, they started prodding me with needles and poking needles in me, and then I woke up nine days later. Um, I was paralyzed from the waist down. Um, they, uh, they said I probably would um, never walk without the assistance of a cane and that they were sending me to a, a nursing home for physical therapy. And I believe that this is when the Lord took over in my life, and I believe I was sent there. Um, I started with my physical therapy. I was um, with some people that are a lot older than my brothers and sisters that are here. Um, they all supported me. I was in the nursing home for four months. 
um, and I took my first steps unassisted on February 28th. Um, and then a friend of one of the patients that was there said he knew of a place called Teen Challenge, and it sounded like I needed a long-term care for my alcohol abuse. So then I came to Teen Challenge, and the Lord brought me new brothers and sisters. Um, I learned to walk again, but more importantly, I found the Lord. Um, and I love the Lord. He's done, like, like I said, they never told me I would walk without the assistance of a cane, and I have accomplished that. Um, and then I found out in July that from all my drinking, I damaged my kidneys and they're not functioning properly. Um, so we have a chapel at Teen Challenge, and I went in and prayed, and I asked the Lord to heal me from this and, and make it so I wouldn't have to have anything drastic with my kidneys. And the Lord has blessed me. The last time I went to the doctor, um, my numbers were back down, but they were in a normal passing range, and so far so good on my kidneys. And the Lord has rescued me again. And I'd like to end this with... My favorite verse of the Bible is one, um, Psalms 107.20. He sent his word and healed them. He rescued them from their own destruction. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, church. Good morning, prayer house. Um, you got to bear with me a little bit. I had a wisdom tooth pulled, so I'm kind of like... I don't know. Anyways, my name is Grace. I'm 41 years old. I'm from the south side of Milwaukee. I was born and raised there. Um, I uh, grew up in kind of a dysfunctional family. Um, there was a lot of abuse. There was drug abuse and alcoholism and domestic violence. And my parents divorced by the time I was 12. And then uh, I kind of took care of myself and my brother. And, and, um, and it was difficult raising myself. Um, my dad worked a lot, and he wasn't really there that much to discipline us. My mom kind of left out of the picture. She was really broken, so I didn't really have the motherly advice that I kind of needed growing up as a little girl. Excuse me. And um, so I turned to drugs and alcohol really early. Um, I was 12 the first time I had a drink. Uh, the first time I got high, I was 12, 13. Um, I was uh, being sexually active at the age of 13. Um, running after some type of love I was trying to find that I couldn't quite grab a hold of. By the time I was 15, I was selling drugs and running around with the wrong people, <laughs> a whole lot of wrong people. Um, I was pregnant by the time I was 17, and then uh, I was just, by the time I was 24, I was a single mom with two kids, and, and I was just still on that search for some type of love. Um, uh, I was an alcoholic by the time I was, my son was born, and I just, I couldn't drink enough. I mean, I could not keep myself numb enough. I needed to be numb all the time. I didn't want to think or feel anything, which was really bad. I was functional, and I worked. I don't even know how I got through it sometimes, because I just would work full time, 40, 50 hours a week, and still function through all that. I don't know how I did it sometimes. But um, I ended up in jail. I went to jail. I sat in jail for quite some time, and um, I sat some charges, and I had to pay tons of fines and court costs. And after all that, I still could not put down that bottle of booze or my drugs. And um, it wasn't until st uh, people started passing away in my life. My aunt passed away. She overdosed on drugs. My brother passed away. He was a, a cocaine addict. Um, my uncle passed away, my grandparents passed away, and all these people were passing away within like the last five years. All these people started passing away. And I was like, what is really going on? And I really thought to myself, this is crazy, I'm gonna die. If I don't put down, put down these drugs and this alcohol, I'm gonna die. And uh, I was in that pit. I was in that pit and I was just in this despair and there was no windows, I couldn't see. And I'm like, man, I can't do this. I want to see again. And I just, I, I, it was then and there where I was just like, you know what? I need something. Um, and, and then I started reading the Bible a little bit. I always had my Bible next to my bed for some odd reason, but I never would look at it. It would be in the drawer, and then I'd put it out, and I'd kind of look at it a little bit, and then it wouldn't. I, so I don't know. I just started reading it. I did some, did some um, AODA counseling, 
And at the end of it all, I knew that I needed way much more than that. There was just so much going on in the root of myself that I needed a lot of time just to myself. And then when I found Teen Challenge, that's where you find the time. This year program is unbelievably amazing. It takes you away from that old life, puts you into a new life, surrounds you with people that love Jesus, and it gets you into this relationship with God that's absolutely unreal. Uh, you know, when we walk in the world, I've been walking in the world my whole life. I've walked in this world. And now that I'm walking in the spirit, I see things so different. It's just beautiful. This life we live in is just beautiful. And, and you know, God created this, and he created us, and, and we, sh we should know that we're worthy enough. You know, we should know that we're worthy enough. So in Job, it says, um, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And uh, that's a great scripture for me because, you know, you, we want to be shiny. And he's making me clean and new, and it feels great. So thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. It's a pleasure. We can't wait to rejoice and have some fellowship. So thanks, church. What's going on, church? My name is Alex. I'm 22 years old from Milwaukee. And uh, so when I was a kid, I was raised in a Christian home. Um, everything seemed fine on the surface, but... Underneath, there was a lot of arguing and stuff between my parents and uh, conflict between my oldest brother and my parents and a lot of stuff. So, um, you know, I thought as I was a kid, I was a Christian, but I was the type of Christian that could do whatever I wanted to do without the consequences, so I thought. So um, when I was 14 years old, my parents ended up getting a divorce, and my oldest brother went into the military. And... Uh, Instead of looking to God like I was taught, I looked to friends and drugs. And um, so from 14 until 20, it just snowballed and snowballed and went from prescription painkillers to heroin to cocaine. And so then when I was 20 years old, I ended up going into rehab. Um, and I had about six months clean, but it became all about what I was doing. I started to look good, I started to feel good. Um, and it was all about what I had done and what I was doing, and it wasn't about what God's grace had did for me. You know, it wasn't about what he was doing in me, and obviously when you do that, it comes to a halt real quick, and God humbles you real quick. And I um, ended up relapsing and going to jail, getting in and out of jail, in and out of treatments for the next two years, really, and um, last November, I got an infection. I spent about six weeks in the hospital, used in the hospital, got out, caught a charge from using in the hospital, was on the run, had like two warrants, um, and then ended up overdosing in Milwaukee. And I remember waking up in the hospital, crying out to God, God, why'd you let me wake up? I thought I'd never find victory over my addiction. I thought that this was how I was supposed to live the rest of my life forever. And uh, I didn't want to fight anymore. I didn't know how to fight anymore. And uh, I ended up going to jail and spending a couple months in jail. And um, the opportunity came up to go come to Teen Challenge. And I remember I'm sitting in my cell and I made a list of pros and cons for Teen Challenge. And my pros list was like this big and my cons list was like this big. And then they said, you have to sing in the choir, too. I was like, nope, definitely not going. And, um, you know, I just sat there that day, and I, I rationalized why I shouldn't go, and I thought in my head it was really good ideas for why another program would be best, why a secular program would be best or whatever. But if you look in my past, none of them ever worked, and that was because it was all about we, what we could do. It wasn't about what Christ could do and what his grace could do and how sufficient his grace really is. Uh, we, we sang this song, uh, Unending Love and Amazing Grace, you know. I don't know about you guys, but his grace is definitely sufficient for me. Um, and if it wasn't for his grace, I, I don't deserve to be standing up here talking to you guys, you know. But God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And that's what we are. And... Um, I just want to be a vessel for him today and be able to share my story and maybe help someone. So thank you for having us, guys. Good morning, church. Um, 
First and foremost, I'd like to thank God for giving us the opportunity to, uh, you know, give out these incredible testimonies and just seeing how many obstacles everybody can overcome. Uh, I'm a little nervous. So. <laughs> but um, my name is Corville Williams. I'm from the inner city of Milwaukee. And, you know, I grew up, my mother and grandmother raising me. And I always hung around older people. You know, I love being around older people. And, but the people that were older than me, they was, you know, involving such as robbery, selling drugs, and depriving people out their things. And I was learning the wrong type of guidance. Um, I never had a father in my life. And that also built up a lot of resentment that was going on. And as the age 13, I ended up using marijuana and indulging in criminal activities such as robbery, depriving people out their things, and just, just doing anything just to get by to make cash. And that was my priority, and, uh, which is the wrong one. And as I got older, once I turned 17, I ended up getting in legal trouble, um, ended up doing time for a robbery. And it was just like back and forth, just ended up getting locked up for petty crimes and just trying to find a way, trying to trying to figure out things. And that's what, you know, in the past in my life was all about, just trying to figure out stuff. And it's like recently, you know, um, before I was coming home from doing this time in the Supermax in Green Bay Correctional Facility, and um, I was in the hole. I had did uh, 2016 and 17 in solitary confinement, and it broke me. I was, I was, you know, I just thought I didn't have no life left. And um, once I got released, you know, I got driven and tried to live life as a law by a citizen and work, you know, had an apartment. But my priority still wasn't right because I was relapsing, hanging out with the same people that, you know, got me in the same situations. And I just had a moment of clarity. It was just like, I got to stop living like this. You know, I want to do better. You know, I want to be a mentor for the youth, you know. And I ended up checking in the mental hospital in St. Francis, that's in Milwaukee. And I remember uh, Brandon, which is the intake coordinator, he looked at me, he was like, man, you just need hope. You know, God, you know, God just got to give you a little bit of hope, man. And it was like, you know, during my trials and tribulations in Teen Challenge, you know, I went through a lot. And I appreciated God, you know, it built my, my unconditional love for him. And, you know, I feel good. I, I, I feel driven and hungry. You know, it, it helped me out. It helped me, helped me through the storm. And I just like to say, you know, I always thought success and money and, you know, materialistic things was just important in life, but that's not important. What's important is God's grace. And that's what makes you successful. And I just like to say, once again, I appreciate you guys listening to our testimonies. I, I appreciate you guys, you know, just hearing me out. You know, I appreciate everybody here, everybody. And uh, have a God-blessed day, and thank you. Hi. My name's Tara. I'm 32 years old. Um, I was born in Hope, Arkansas. Um, the first six years of my life, I lived in a tent on the Arkansas River. My parents were heavily addicted to methamphetamines, and um, that was my life. Um, they ended up catching a federal drug drug charge, and uh, my mom took me and my brother, and we moved to Southern Illinois. At that time, she ended up marrying a, a man, and six weeks later, she got married to him, and we moved to Houston, Texas, and that's where I grew up. So um, during that time, my stepfather was very physically, emotionally, and mentally abusive towards me. We didn't get along at all. Um, it was just constant chaos in the household and um, just a lot of fighting and just craziness. Um, my, he ended up giving my mother an ultimatum uh, that one of us had to leave the house. And at 14 years old, I got introduced to the streets of Houston, Texas. And it was a rough lifestyle. Um, 14 years old as a female is really hard. and. Um, I ended up running with street gangs, and um, that was my protection. That's what I knew. That's what where I found comfort, as crazy as it sounds. Um, during that time, I ended up um, meeting a man that um, 
I felt was my protector. And uh, he had told me that he was wanted for multiple murders, but I'd never um, took heed to it. I was real naive. Um, I had lived a pretty sheltered life with my parents being on meth for all those years. It was really secluded, and I was naive, um, even still after being on the streets and introduced to it, still of the madness in the world and uh, the evil. Um, and uh, so I just kind of went with him, and um, before lo too long, I was looking at attempted or accessory to murder charges myself. Um, during that time, I did what I knew, what I was taught, and I ran to Southern Illinois um, to seek, seek kind of refuge. I never took um, responsibility for anything that happened in my life. I was kind of just like a victim. This is what God dealt me. This is um, what I was supposed to live in. Um, just kind of rolled with it. I didn't even fall into any kind of depression. It was just a way of life. Um, I never demanded better for myself. I didn't know better for myself, and I wasn't trying to change anything. So from there, um, I ended up meeting a drug dealer and had my first child at the age of 20. Um, later on, I had a set of twins the next year, and um, me and their dad fought constantly. Um, I ended up being sent home from the hospital with Percocets, and um, that's where it started for me. Um, within just a couple days after my prescription ran out, I was shooting heroin. Um, from that time, I, I did that for a little while, and um, then I, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to take the pain away. And so I started picking up drinking. Drinking um, took me to this whole nother level of things in a, in a level of complete obliteration where I didn't feel anything um, on a completely new level than any drug ever did for me, and um, I liked it. So I found myself getting on the methadone clinic to wean off of the heroin and just picked the bottle up instead, and I was drinking two handles of vodka a day, walking and talking normally, um, keeping a job. Pretty soon it got to be where it just overtook my life. Um, me and the kids' father would fight constantly. Um, it was chaos. My kids and him would lock themselves in the bathroom um, because I would turn so crazy on the liquor. And um, he's actually in prison right now. We've lost custody of our children due to domestic violence. Um, neighbors would call the police every day, it seemed like. And uh, so after that, I felt like I had nothing to live for once my kids got taken. Um, I was in and out of psych wards. Um, I've been in, in the ICU over 50 times last year along, but um, God had a purpose for me. He, death just wasn't, wasn't it. And um, so finally, my uncle actually had went to Teen Challenge in um, Michigan 15 years ago, and he just um, opened his own church down in Arkansas. And he had kind of planted the seed for me last year, but I still... Um, was living prideful. I wasn't ready to submit it was to God's will. Um, that street mentality gets you thinking like um, you run your own show and you're in control when you're not really running anything. And uh, so I just had to go down deeper and deeper. And I don't know at what point where I truly hit a rock bottom because I had been at the rock bottom. Um, God just called me out, and I um, surrendered and came into this program in December. I'm actually graduating the program next week. And um, yes, praise God. And uh, when I just think about what he's called me out of and what he's called me to, it just touches me. Um, because there's some things that are worse than dying, and that's the life I was living before I came in here. And um, I'm just so grateful for the grace that he's given me because I don't deserve it. And we all fall short of it every day. And um, I'm just thankful to be alive. I actually, you know, like the person that looks back at me in the mirror every morning. And, you know, I'm just praising God when I wake up and trying to just walk around with the most positive attitude because um, he's just revealed himself in such a way that I'll forever be grateful. Um, my plans after graduation are staying. I'm enrolling into ministry school, and the Lord's just put it on my heart to um, try to help other people come out of that same darkness 
because it can be so dark and there's so much that we're missing not walking with him um, in ways I could have never ever dreamed that he would reveal to me. And um, now I just have this hope and the scripture that has kept coming up for me in this program is 1 John 4, 4, and that's he who lives in me is greater than he who lives in the world. And it's so true because he's way bigger than my situation ever was. And um, he's just called me out into something higher and I'm just grateful. And um, if you're missing that peace, just call in the name of Jesus, just call in that name, even when you don't have anything else to say or can't think of anything. Um, will give you the most peace you've ever known. I just want to thank you, church. Can we just praise the Lord again? <laughs> you know, we serve an awesome God. I can't even, you know, words can't even express um, what he's doing in all of our lives. Um, you know, he moves in silence, too. I think we expect God to move in a big noise, and he can. But a lot of time he's moving when we're not even thinking he's moving. Um, and he's moving in our hearts a lot of times. Um, but it's a three easy process how to get somebody into the program. One, you got to make initial contact um, by calling me. And then uh, I would either email you or somehow get you an application. And you, you guys have to submit that to the individual. They have to fill it out. There's some personal questions that maybe you may not be able to um, answer. And then from there, I receive it, I look it over, and then uh, I either have a phone conversation, a phone interview, or an interview in person, depending on how far you are away from the center. Um, around that time, uh, the individual needs to go to detox. Um, it normally takes three to five days, depending on how bad um, their addiction is. It can be done at home, but we stress that you go in and if you have insurance. I know some people don't have insurance. If you have insurance to go somewhere, especially if you're dealing with alcohol or benzo withdrawals, that can actually become life-threatening um, if it's as bad as um, if it's a bad addiction. Um, but through that process, we can do all the other steps. And then from there, um, you would come into the center, whether it be the women's house or the men's house. Um, and if you, we get a lot of people coming from Illinois, so there is a couple centers in Illinois too. Um, that we can point you to, but a lot of people like to get away from where they were and come here, which is good. And then there is a couple ways you guys can help us too. Um, I know when I was looking at the application, I was inside jail, um, and I was looking at all the cost, you know, monthly cost, intake fee, but what's important about Teen Challenge is it, it opens up its doors for people who are less fortunate. Um, whether you're living on the street, whether you only have the clothes on your back, it doesn't matter. If you have no funds or if you have funds, some, some funds will open up the doors. And that's what was important for me. I didn't have any money. And if this facility asked for money, I would have got turned away and I would have went to prison. Um, but I'm just thankful today that there's a spot where you can go that's free. And you know what's important about this spot? It has Jesus. You know, it, like... Look. Like the video said, we could put the clothes on their back, we could feed them, we can give them a haircut, that doesn't matter. All that matters is eternity, and that's with Jesus, and that's what's important. And that's how you can tell God's hands in this program, because it's free of charge at people who need it. And that's the gospel. You know, God went to those people, Jesus went to those people, he sat, he sat and ate with the sinners. And that's what we're about, we bring people in, we teach them the gospel, and that's what's important. Um, there is a couple other ways you guys can help us. One, we have a thrift store located in Milwaukee. Um, you guys can either come in and buy stuff or you can donate. All the funds that are made from there goes to help people get into the program like myself or anyone else who didn't have money. If you guys, we do also have an auto donation program. If you have a junk car, if you have a nice car, you can donate it to us. Um, we'll fix it, we'll clean it, we'll send it to auction, otherwise we'll just scrap it. Um, we have all this information on the resource table out in the foyer. Um, Brian and Brian will be there. The double B's will be there if you have any questions, um, concerns. And like, you know, I can't stress enough, we appreciate you guys coming here. This is my third time being here. You know, I appreciate it. I recognize some faces. It's always nice when you feel like you're at home. So thank you guys.